very thankful for Brother DeWayne's prayer. Would ask for a continuation of your prayers this morning. As I stated early, and I believe it to be one of the greatest problems in the United States of America among God's people is a lack of interest in the Lord. Uh, and that's something that not only can happen in this country, but it can happen in any country to the Lord's people. The first thing I want to do is read a verse and then talk about that verse a little bit and try to get into the verse. We all know that life is very brief. It's very brief. We know that we're here like a vapor for just a little time. We appear for a little time and then our lives vanish away. What we do how we spend our time and how we spend our money will always, always denote how important Jesus Christ is in our lives. It's just a fact. By the way we live and by the things that we do and by the way we spend our money, that'll tell the tale. Now, we're not fooling anyone because the Lord knows our hearts. He knows where our treasures are. He knows what our thoughts are in this life, what's important to us. and It's something that we need to be mindful of in our lives. This verse says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. This is a verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. It's verse 13. And we're going to look at that verse and what that verse means to us, Lord being our helpers this morning. But the first thing we must remember that life is a battle. Some people lose the battle constantly. It really is. It's a fight. The Bible expresses that. Why do you think the Bible was written? It was written to God's people because of this fight and this battle that they're going to endure all the days of their lives. Satan lost the battle at the cross of Calvary. He lost. But he's been loosed for a season, if you would, to make war with the saints. And every time he can distract you in any manner, it doesn't matter what it is, and if he can make you think something else is more important than him, than the Lord Jesus Christ, Satan has won a battle. And he's winning battles by the gobs, if you would, among God's people in this country. He really is. Their need for the Lord is often only found when the Lord brings them to the end of their way. When life gets so difficult, they've got nowhere else to turn. But up until that time, their focus oftentimes is not where it should be for the one who walked down that road of Calvary all by himself without my help or yours to do what you and I could never do, to give you the hope of living in a life that will not entangle you in the difficulties that we see here today and that we live through every day of our life. We won't have those troubles when we go to heaven. And you know, there won't be anything in heaven that will distract you from the Lord. Can you imagine that? As I stated a while ago, before our, we started this service, the Bible tells us in Luke 15, we're to hate our husband, we're to hate our wife, we're to hate our children, our mothers, our fathers. He uses the word hate. It doesn't mean you're not to love them, but the Lord expresses that, that word with such strength that you might realize if you put your family before the Lord Jesus Christ, you've done the wrong thing. It's just Whether you like me saying it or not, it's the truth. And a lot of times the truth has no effect upon us in life because we do what we want to do. In America, that's what most of us have done. We've been given liberty and freedom, and we've prospered in a way that God's people have not prospered, and we do what we want to do. But this verse teaches us about a battle that you and I incur all the days of our life. The Bible tells us it's a battle between good and evil, dark and light, darkness and light, light being good, a righteousness and unrighteousness, this battle goes on all the days of our lives. The Apostle Paul said, I fought a good fight. I'm going to tell you, it's a fight. From the day you begin to follow Jesus Christ, begin to do what you should do, you're going to have an ongoing fight in your life, and there's going to be somebody out there named Satan, not to mention your own flesh, competing for your time, competing for your money, competing for your glory. You see, if Satan can just get you to focus on something for just a little while, and take your eyes off of Jesus Christ, you've given him and this world glory that uh, should be given unto the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, it's, you can put it no other way. That's how it is. 
and we've all come uh, sinned and come short of the glory of God, no doubt about that. But this verse teaches us uh, the things that we need to do and be mindful of as we go through the journey of life. This verse teaches us about living a life uh, and being stable. It means to be fixed or to be firmly established. You know, if you're not fixed or you're firmly established, you, you're like one who maybe w will waver. Peter said over in 2 Peter chapter 1, he, he said, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of this thing, of these things, even though you know them and you're established in the present truth. Peter said you can actually waver from the truth because of your failure to hear the truth preached, your failure to read and study God's word day in and day out, that it, if you're not careful, philosophy of men and the ideas of our own minds will overtake the truth of God's word. Isn't that amazing? But we're told over in Romans chapter 1, it says they took the truth of God and they turned it into a lie and they worshiped the creature more than the creator. Do you realize that even though that was addressing those who were doing things that were not natural to the body, that any time you and I do that, Anytime we take God's truth and we oppose it or we disobey it, we're worshiping ourselves more than God because we're doing what we want to do more than what God would have us to do. It's hard to swallow that, isn't it? You know, the Lord said over in, in Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, you know, you can't serve two masters. But I believe most people are like I have been. They, they want a little each. They want to straddle a fence. One foot in the world, one foot in the kingdom. The Lord said, you can't live that way. He says, you can't serve two masters. But that's what most people, they want just enough religion, if you would, to make them feel good, to make them feel justified. Just enough religion for that. And they want a lot of the world over here to satisfy the flesh. That fight begins in here. And it's a real fight between good and evil. You know, the flesh and the, and the spirit are contrary one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. That literally means that if you walk after the flesh, you're either yielding to the flesh or you're yielding to the spirit if you're a child of God. You know, those who are not children of God, they don't have that option because they don't have the spirit of God dwelling in them. But we as God's children, if we be born of the spirit of God, we either yield to the flesh or we yield to the spirit. And that's the battle that we fight all the days of our lives. It really is. It begins there. And then we have this enemy out there called an adversary who's out to direct your thoughts and your time and, and, and what you think is important. It's away from the Lord Jesus Christ onto the things of your life, your family, your work, whatever it might be. If he can win every little battle he can win, it brings glory to the one who's already defeated. Excuse me. And so we have, we have a real concern. We're told over and uh, <clears throat> we're not to fluctuate. In Hebrews chapter 11, we'll go over and read a verse. In Hebrews chapter 10, excuse me, talks about wavering, and that means to fluctuate. And, and we're, we're not to waver in our faith. We're not to, it says, let us hold fast. Hold fast. There's, there's something in this verse we're going to understand about standing fast in the verse that we took as our text. But it says, let us hold fast our profession of faith without wavering. That means without fluctuation. That means without being pulled away from it. We're not to be as those that were spoken of in Ephesians chapter 4 who are carried away by every wind of doctrine. Some of those winds of doctrine are just the philosophy of men. They're not necessarily what God taught. There is only one true doctrine. Doctrine is what God taught. He didn't teach it in several different ways. He taught it in one way. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other truth apart from Jesus Christ. There is no other way to measure truth. But you know, it's an amazing thing as I've lived my life, and, had, and I've been at fault at it much of my life, how many of God's people are so caught up in this world that they have no focus on the Lord. It's really the truth. And it's a hard pill to swallow, but it's a fact. And as I've talked to some, they think it's because we've prospered and had it so good in this country. Very well may be. But we're warned over and over as God's children in the Bible that this battle is an ongoing battle in our lives. That Satan is our adversary. 
and that we're to do everything we can to watch, to stand fast, to be men and not children, and to be strong. We're not to waver. We're to be stable. You know, we live in one of the most unstable uh, worlds you could live in. Nothing's stable in this world. Everything's changing. Most of the time, uh, for the bad, not for the good. You know, the Bible says that men will wax worse and worse. They're not going to get better. And oftentimes, even though we read those truths, it fails to impress our hearts enough for us as individuals to make those changes. The Bible says, come out from among them and be ye separate, and touch not the unclean thing. It's hard to not do what everybody else is doing, is it not? It's hard not to go the way they're going. Basically, if everybody's doing it, it's bound to be right, correct? Well, oftentimes, if everybody's doing it, it's wrong. It's not the right thing to do. The Bible says, come out from among them and be ye separate. Separate yourselves from those that are not doing right. But it's, it's, a, it's a tough challenge. It's hard. It is a fight. It's a fight you'll have every day of your life. It begins between your spirit and your flesh. Your flesh is something that never loved God, never liked God. You can't be taught to love God. Unless you're first born of the Spirit of God, you cannot see the kingdom of God, neither can you enter into the kingdom of God. So when you have the Spirit of God dwelling in you, the battle is a constant battle to do that which is right, to honor God and to live for His glory. Because we were created for God's glory and for no other purpose. Isn't that amazing as we look around in life and see what we're doing ourselves and what other people are doing and knowing that our life is but a vapor that appeared for a little time and it's going to vanish away, and yet we're living for the moment. We live for the moment so often and for the very time of the day when yet we may not be here tomorrow. We're not promised tomorrow. We were created, as we're told in Revelations 4 and 11, for God's glory. Let me ask you, when you live your life day in and day out, do you live it for God's glory? It's a question I have to ask myself. Do you give God the glory in the workplace? Do you give God the glory in, in your family? I mean, where does God reign in our families? You see, Satan's there, not to mention this old flesh, and he wants to rob God of what rightly, God rightly deserves, and that's glory. We were created for his glory. We're told that there shall no flesh glory in his presence. He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Furthermore, uh, being established is to be steadfast. It means to not waver. And that's what we need to look at. It's so easy, and it's, it's to be distracted in this world. We're not to go to the right or go to the left. We ought to walk on the straight and narrow. And that doesn't mean you, you live a life. That's a life that's focused on Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. It's looking unto him in the workplace. It's looking unto Jesus. How many times do you really pray about the things you do? I tell you, I've heard people say, well, I prayed about it. I prayed about it. And oftentimes they do what they want to do because it's not God's will, it's their will. And they convince themselves that God wanted that to happen, so they've done it. Take some serious meditation and some serious prayer to understand if this is God's will or my will. Because generally, if it's our will, we're going to do everything in, in our possible to make it come to pass. And we're likely to convince ourselves it's God's will. Because that's what we want. Let's get back now to our, <coughs> our text. First of all, it says to watch. That word watch means to not fall asleep. It means to stay awake and to be on guard. Are you watching for your souls and for your life? If you're not, you're not doing what the Bible says we need to do to fight this fight. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 6, fight the good fight of faith. In other words, the faith that was once delivered unto the saints as we're told in the book of Jude. Are you fighting for that faith? Are you contending for that faith? It's a real battle and, and you know, it, it's easy to lose the battle to the world that you live in. Everything's so important and then your life goes up in smoke and you ain't here tomorrow. I, have you ever wondered that in your life, why everything is so overwhelmingly important, especially in place of the Lord, and then we might not be here tomorrow and it won't make any difference, will it? It'll be gone, just like a puff of smoke. 
That's what the Bible says our life is like. And yet we place such an extreme importance sometimes on that little puff of smoke that we lose sight of the God who created all things, including us. <laughs> Excuse me. So we're to watch. Let's notice what it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 23, <coughs> verse 16, I believe it is, or verse 6. It talks about watching, you know. We need to, to watch, really, it means to guard your souls and to guard your life, to be aware of, of the surroundings, be aware of what's happening out here in the world and the influence that it has on you and your children and your grandchildren and, and, and everything that we do, we're told. <coughs> Excuse me. It says, but let none come into the house of the Lord, save the priest, and they that minister of the Levites. They shall go in, for they are holy. But all the people shall keep the watch of the Lord. In other words, put the Lord first in your minds and in your lives and guard that. Because Satan is an adversary. He is. He, he is someone that we battle all the days of our lives. We go over to Ephesians chapter 6. And it says that we have an adversary. His name is Satan, oftentimes known as, as the devil. And at, in the sixth chapter of the book of Ephesians, it tells us that we're to put on the whole armor of God that we might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, the trickery of the devil, the deception of the devil. You know, that's going on every day in our lives. This world and, and, and it doesn't matter it's, if it's at work or in your own mind or your own flesh. It's telling you these things are so important that you don't have time for the Lord. You may not structure your words in that matter, but as I said, where you spend your time and where you spend your money and what you're doing is an evidence. It's an evidence to me that I put other things before the Lord. Have you put anything before the Lord ever? This is, a, this is a challenge we have to, to watch, to be on guard. Because Satan is real. Can we stand against the wiles of the devil? Do we, do we put on the full armor of God? We need to, we need to consider that. Notice back over in, in the book of Nehemiah. You know, it talked about a time, and, and God, if you read his word and you understand his word... A lot of times he gives us real battles, real physical battles like we would know that the army might engage in in this world and he applies that in a spiritual way that we might learn from it. In the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah went back to Jerusalem which had been destroyed and the city had early been in ruins and the captive of, of Jerusalem or, or the Jews was taken into captivity by, uh, in, to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. But a time ended, and the king of Cyprus helped uh, Nehemiah, and he went back to rebuild the walls and sent the materials necessary to rebuild the walls. And, and it says that in verse 7 of Nehemiah chapter 4, but it says it came to pass that Sanibalt and the Arabians and the Amorites and the Ashadites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped, and they were very wroth. Now, you might say, what do those walls have to do with my life? They have everything to do with your life. Do you let your walls down? Are there breaches in your walls? Satan knows your weaknesses. He knows if you've allowed something in your life to take such a great importance to you that you forsake the Lord, he knows your weakness. He knows that if you place anything more important than the Lord in your life, he knows it. I may not know it, but Satan knows it. He knows your weakness and my weakness, regardless of, uh, of what that weakness may be. Satan knows it. Well, these, these, this enemy had been going in and out of Jerusalem at will. There wasn't nothing there but a bunch of ruins. The walls were down. The gates were torn down. The walls had breaches in them. Nehemiah goes back and he begins to tear down, uh, repair those walls and repair those breaches. He goes down in verse 9. He says, nevertheless... 
we made our prayer unto God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. What is the lesson for you and I there? Are you watching for your soul and the souls of those you love day and night, realizing that Satan is attempting to enter into your life and disrupt it at any cost? Friends, I'm telling you, Satan knows how weak we are. We're told over there to watch in, in uh, 26th chapter of Matthew. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. Indeed, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Boy, there's a great lesson about it. Our flesh is weak. Paul said, I fought a good fight. And it began with his flesh and the spirit that dwelled within him. To do the right thing is never always or never, most time, never the easy thing to do. Because your flesh despises God. It doesn't love God and it never has loved God. You understand that? Unless you're born of the spirit of God, you will not love him. We love him because he first loved us. Not because some friend come by or that we married into it or any other thing. If you really love God, it's because God has dealt with you in your heart. God has brought about the change. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I don't have the ability to born you again. You don't have the ability to born yourself or anyone else. That, that miraculous power belongs to the omnipotent power of God Almighty. And unless you are born of the Spirit of God, you can't see the kingdom of God. He said in verse 5, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, unless you're born of the Spirit and of water, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Unless you've been cleansed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's what the water has a, a tendency to teach us there, and born of the Spirit, you can't enter into the kingdom of God. Somebody might take you by the hand and bring you in, but it'll never be of any benefit to you. You can't lead the dead to life. That's just a fact. That's the Fan, uh, fallacy of this world is they believe they can bring the dead to life. They can make you a child of God by bringing you to church. You can't make anybody a child of God by bringing them to church. It's impossible. It takes a power above and beyond any power that you and I have. It takes res resurrection power. The Bible tells us what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe. It's according to our agreement with the mighty power wrought in Christ when he was raised from the dead. Did you realize for you to be a believer in Jesus Christ, it took the same power that it took to raise Jesus from the dead? I don't have that power. Neither do you. Don't fool yourselves. You're not going to save anybody. You're not going to deliver anybody. You're not going to bring anybody to Christ. You can express the good news of Jesus Christ, but unless that person's been born of the Spirit of God... It'll never dwell in his heart. It'll never find a resting place in his heart, place in his heart and soul. Those who rejoice in the Savior's love are those who understand that Jesus came and he saved his people from their sins and he gave unto them eternal life and this life dwells in them and they rejoice and they have hope beyond this life. And for those of us who have been born of the Spirit of God, this verse tells us to watch, to be mindful, to guard against the things of this world that distract you from this life, from serving God. And friends, I'm going to tell you, the distractions are numerous. There's a list that you can begin to write that you can never come to an end. Now, we know that we have to work. If we do not work, the Lord says, you know, we ought not to eat. It's given to us to work. <clears throat> but we're never to allow those things to take precedence in our life. Christ is to always have the preeminence. And you know, we all know how we stand there personally. We all know. Everybody sitting here knows if Jesus is number one in their life. We all know that. I don't know it, but you know yourself. And you're the only one that does know. But I'll tell you somebody that does beside you, and that's God. God knows your thoughts. God knows your heart. He knows if he's important to you or not important to you. He knows where you spend your time and spend your money. And he understands as he's given us in his word, the great difficulties, the great problems that we have and encounter in this world. And he began to tell us to watch. You see, these, this literal, literal story in Nehemiah was a story of begin, when they began to build those walls back. He said to set a watch night and day. Well, friends, in America, God's children have went to sleep. They're not watching for the souls of themselves and for others. They've allowed the things of this life and this world 
to take control of their minds and their thoughts. I believe that. Christianity is not on the decline by accident. It's not a coincidence. God is not surprised. It's because we failed to watch. The watchman has went to sleep. They set a watch. Notice what it says in Jeremiah chapter 7 and I mean, Nehemiah chapter 7 and verse 3, and it says, And I said unto them, Let not the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun be hot. And while they stand by, let them shut the doors and bar them and appoint watches uh, of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, everyone in his watch and everyone to be over against the house. God commanded us to watch over our house. Not just the church, but our house. To watch over our children. To be instrumental in what they do in their lives. To be instrumental in what's important to them. You know, we're to bring our children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Not the Sunday schools. I'm sorry, brothers and sisters. The Bible teaches us that a dad, it begins with dad. Begins with the dad, the father of the house. That's where it all begins. And if we do not take, it, God, that wasn't one of God's great pieces of advice. It wasn't something that God said, you know, if you feel like it, you ought to do it. If we want to see churches full, we want to see the, the growth in Christianity, then God's way is the only way. He is the rock. His work is perfect. His ways are perfect. His work is perfect. And when we begin to decide that we have a better way, and that's really where man falls short and has for many, many, many thousands of years. Man always has believed that he had a better way than God did. But I'm here to tell you, man has never had a better way. God's ways are perfect even though we don't follow them. And to understand that's where we begin. Begin to understand that this world is not our friend, that we're in a battle between good and evil, light and dark, wrong and right, righteousness and unrighteousness. It's an ongoing battle in our lives. We're going to fight it all the days of our lives until we close our eyes in death. We're to watch, watch and pray. That you, not enter, that you do not enter into temptation. You know, it's so easy to enter into temptation. Temptation surrounds us day in and day out. We're led away into temptation. We're to watch and pray. Why is it? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Our flesh is so weak that if we're not on guard all the time, we'll be taken in by temptation. Watch ye, this verse says. And we, we think about that, and it says to stand fast. What does it mean to stand fast? It means to be stationary. It means to persevere, to continue and to abide. That's what it means. It means not not to go to the left or to the right. You know, Jesus is the only way. He's the way, the truth, and the life. There are not several ways that Jesus said you can take. There is one way, and it's his way. And there is no other way for the child of God that's the right way. Now, man has devised a way. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is the ways of death, and that means the ways of ruin. There is a wide gate and a broad way that leadeth to destruction, and there be many that go in thereat. That's how many of God's children, they enter into the wide gate and the broad way, and that's where the populace is going. That's the well-traveled road. That's where everybody in this world is going, including many of God's children. And they follow in that road, and that road is the ways of destruction and ruin. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth to life. Not eternal life, but to a life of true blessings. I can, I can name, maybe on both hands, the men I've known in my life that probably went down that road, and that doesn't include me. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth to life, and there be few that go in thereat, that understand and realize the blessings that God talked about while we live here in this natural life upon the earth. But we must watch if we're going to have that life. We must be on guard. We can't fall asleep because the enemy never goes to sleep. Did you know that? Satan never rests. Now one day he's going to be cast into to hell itself, bound in chains to be there forever and ever. But he's been loosed for a season, and he is having rabbit. Uh, you know, he, he's giving all kinds of trouble to God's children here in this world. Wrecking havoc on them right now as we speak. We see it in this country. I tell you, there's no doubt in my mind that that Satan is having a heyday in this country today. Why? Because the watchman's went to sleep. And that watchman begins with mom and dad. It begins with the father. 
and the mother is a helpmate. You know, that's God's perfect way. God never said that the woman was to be the spiritual leader of the household. The man is. God's way is perfect. Now, man has taken and devised, and they'll take a verse here and there out of context and say, see here? But friends, I'm here to tell you, God's way is the perfect way. If you get anything out of this message, you understand that Deuteronomy 32 and 4. He is the rock, and he is, his way is perfect. His works are perfect. His ideas are perfect. That doesn't mean we're going to follow them, but that doesn't mean they're not perfect. They are. It has nothing to do. You know, we can disobey the truth, but it doesn't change the truth. The truth will stand forever. God's truth will never fade away. We're to stand fast. It says we're to stand fast in the faith. In the faith once delivered unto the saints. That means when, if you know the truth, we're not to waver from it. We're not to flux away. We're not to go to the right or go to the left. Many of God's children have went to the right and they went to the left. They've faded away from the truth. They've taken God's word. You know what it says in uh, Romans 1? They've taken the truth of God and turned it into a lie and worshiped the creature more than the creator. Anytime we disobey God, we're worshiping ourselves more than the creator. We're doing what we want to do. Stand fast. Galatians 5 and 1 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free and not be entangled again therein. In other words, the law was put away by the work the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're not to be entangled in a works doctrine or a work system. We were made as children of God. We were given eternal life by the work of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And he set us at liberty. Stand fast in the liberty. Let's notice in Philippians chapter 4 and verse, or 1 and verse 27. It says, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. And whether I come <coughs> excuse me, and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. Stand fast. Be stationary in the gospel. Don't be led astray. I tell you, there has been men in cunning areas all their life deceiving trying to lead you this way or lead you that way. Stand in the truth. Be stationary in the truth. You know, we're to worship in spirit and truth, and I'm going to tell you today the truth's important. It's extremely important. My ideas and my personal thoughts and the philosophy of all this worldly wisdom is not important. God's truth is what, what's important. We're to stand fast in that truth. It says in the fourth uh Philippians 4, 1, it says, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord. Stand fast in the Lord. Make him first in your life. Don't, don't waver from it. Don't let your profession of faith waver. Stand fast in the Lord Jesus Christ. Stand fast in his truth and in him. We notice in 1 Thessalonians, we get another verse. There's several of these verses that talk about our standing with the Lord, <coughs> excuse me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 8. For now we live if you stand fast, if, that's conditional, if you stand fast in the Lord. That means the Lord should have preeminence in your lives. You know, we waver when we allow the world or, or anything in this world to, to come before the Lord. And you know, that's not an easy task. It takes a conscious effort every day to put Jesus Christ first because we're busy creatures. we got all this noise going on around us. We're working hard. We're trying to make money. We're raising children. We're trying to see the, the, you know, all our children as often as we can and be with our friends and, and all these things. And pretty soon, if you're not careful, you lose sight of the Lord and all the clutter. That's really what we do, the noise, I call it. It's just clutter. Because when you pass from this life, you're not taking any of it with you. You're not taking your family members with you. They may be there one day, but you're not taking them with you. You're not taking your money, your silver, your gold. You're not taking any of that with you. You're going to the Lord on your own, by yourself. He will take you by the hand and lead you home. We need to put the Lord first at all times in our life. We notice in 2 Thessalonians <coughs> chapter 2 and verse 15. 
Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you've been taught, whether by word or our epistle. In the things that God teaches us, we're to stand fast in those things. Whether Paul said, I taught them to you and preached them to you, or you learn from the reading of God's word, we're to fans that stand fast. In other words, we're to be stationary. We're not to be cared about by every wind of doctrine. We're told in Deuteronomy 30, Deuteronomy 30 that they went to the right and they went to the left. They got to a point that they said, remove the Holy One of Israel from us. Can you imagine God's people getting to a point that they said, remove God from our lives. He's a hindrance to what we want to do. That's what they said in Deuteronomy 30. You read Deuteronomy 30 sometimes and it'll give you an idea of where God's people can end up over a period of time. They couldn't do what they wanted to do. They wanted to hear smooth things preached to them. You know, <clears throat> excuse me, when, God, when, when God's people take God's truth and turn it into a lie, they do it because they want to do those things that God said were an abomination unto them. And that's any sin, if you want to get technical. That's anything, any sin. And that's where we go. Because man has always wanted to be his own God and do his own thing. And yet we're accountable to no one but the God of heaven. We're to watch and guard ourselves. We're to stand fast in God's truth and stand fast in the Lord. And then it says, quit you like men. Do you know what that means? First of all, it means don't act like children. Grow up, <laughs> if you want to get technical about it. Verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 14 says, Brethren, be not children in understanding. You know, sometimes the Lord says we're very childish, we're very foolish. How be it in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. Quit ye like men, that verse says. Be, be men and understand like men. We're told in the 13th chapter, in verse 11 says, When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. You know, we're to put away the childish and foolish things of this world and think like a man, a grown adult, one that is mature in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I understand that we owe him everything and he owes us nothing, but by his mercy and grace has given us not only hope, but eternal life that one day the difficulties that you and I face will not face any longer. We need to put him first. That's the biggest problem I see in Christianity today is the failure to put the Lord first in life because of all the noise, because of all the troubles. And then it says, we'll move on here to kind of cl close this out. It says, and be strong. We're told in Ephesians chapter 2 that we're, my, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Do you realize that you can't overcome the difficulties of Satan? Unless you're strong in the Lord. You don't have the strength. You know a lot of people believe they have the strength to do what they want to. But you don't have the strength to overcome the fiery darts of Satan. You don't have the strength to overcome him without the Lord's help. You just don't. And if you're going it alone, you don't have much hope. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Not strong in yourself. Not strong in the preacher. Strong in the Lord. To be strong in the Lord, the Lord has to be a... Uh, have the preeminence in your life. He has to be a part of your life every day, in the morning, at night. When you're going through the difficulties of life, the Lord has to be your strength. Paul said, I can do all things through me. No, he said, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthened me. That's a fallacy that God's people have. They believe they can do things they cannot do without the Lord's help. We can't be the, have the strength we need. We can't be as strong as we ought to be without God's help. He says, he goes on and says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, the trickery of the devil. You know, the Bible displays this battle between good and evil as a battlefield. And we're soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible equips us to go out in this battle called life and to do battle with the one that has our least interest in in concern, and that's Satan. As I said, his biggest victory is when he can distract you from Jesus Christ. And I'm not talking about Sunday morning. Yes, that's an important time. When you no longer come to the house of the Lord, he's won a battle. 
This is what Satan, Satan doesn't want you here. Satan doesn't want you praying. Satan wants your mind consumed with this world. Whatever it is that consumes your mind, if it's not Jesus Christ, Satan is winning a victory because that's, he, he's lost the battle. We're going to go to heaven not based upon what we do, thank goodness, not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to his mercy he hath saved us. It was God's mercy that saved us to, to a home in heaven. But the battle in this life goes on and on. And if you love the Lord the way that we ought to love the Lord, because he first loved us, we do love him. We ought to want to give him all the glory he needs. We need to be strong and we need to be prepared to do battle every day. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Why would we do that? Notice verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Some people say, well, I don't, I don't have those kind of battles. Yeah, you do. You know that young man that was with Elijah? When that enemy came around and surrounded the house and Elijah said, don't worry, there's more with us than there are with them. He thought, you know, you're crazy. There's two of us, none of them. And he asked God to open his eyes. And there was an army of angels around those men that couldn't be numbered. The battle is real in your life whether you want to admit it. If God is not first in your life, if everything else in this world is taking up your thoughts and your time, Satan is having an influence on your life. He really is. We're to watch. We're to guard. We're to guard against that. That's where it all begins is guarding against it. That means we've got to recognize there's something wrong. If you never recognize there's something wrong, you'll never make an attempt to fix it, to make it any better. First, it, we've got to recognize it. Are we standing fast? Are we watching? Are we on guard? Are we on guard for our children? Are we on guard for ourselves? You know, Satan doesn't sleep. Satan never gives up. There's coming a day that he'll be cast out. But until that day, in the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, this battle goes on. We're to be strong. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You know, we're also told that there is a war. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So many people hear about a battle as we read about over in Nehemiah. That battle is to teach us a spiritual lesson. And that lesson is... That we have weaknesses. We have breaches in our wall. And Satan's looking at your uh, breaches, whatever they may be, your weaknesses. All of our weaknesses can be different. But Satan knows them and he's looking for a way in. They made their prayer and they set a watch day and night. In America, the watchman has went asleep. That's what I believe has happened. We, we're not guarding our souls, our lives, our children's lives day and night as the Bible teaches us. And Satan is having a heyday in this country. We see hatred at a level that I've never seen it. We see lying going on at a level I've never seen. I mean, the things of God are being put aside, and Satan is winning a lot of battles. Thanks be to God that he didn't win the ultimate battle, and that battle at the cross of Calvary. It goes on, and it says, Wherefore, <clears throat> take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. I ask you today, when it comes to Jesus Christ, have you done all that you can do to stand? To stand fast in his truth, and to honor his name, to assemble yourselves every opportunity you have, because God commanded us to do so. Have you done all you can do to stand? I know I haven't. Maybe I haven't put on the whole armor of God. You see... The battle is real out here in life. And Satan is a real enemy. He's a real adversary. And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, carnal, but they're mighty through God. Mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. They're not mighty through me, the preacher, or any other preacher, or, or your brothers and sisters, or even yourself. They're mighty through God. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Not my might, not your might, but the might of Almighty God. Be strong in the Lord. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But they're strong through God to the pulling down of strongholds. One of the strongholds that needs to be pulled down is ourselves. Notice what it continues to say in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 
How do we do that? How do we begin to do that? This right here, if we would all take this teaching of Paul to our minds, it would make a difference in our lives. We ought to get up and read this every day. First of all, it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. Is there anything in your life that exalts itself against the knowledge of God? And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. If we done those two things, our lives would be totally different. In other words, if our imaginations and our minds are thinking of things outside of God, they ought to be cast down. And we ought to be looking unto God. You know, the war is real. And maybe we've thrown our hands up in defeat. But Satan hadn't quit, and he's not going to quit. He's not going to quit till the Lord Jesus Christ returns, and I hope that's today. I hope that's this afternoon because I'm ready. The sooner, the better. But I don't know when that day is. Neither do you. We don't know the day, the hour, or the time. But we're to put on the whole armor of God if we're going to go out to do battle. The Lord said it's a battlefield, and there's a real enemy out there, and his name is Satan. It begins here with that old flesh we have that despises God to begin with. And then we got that adversary out there. He's tricking us in every way that he knows possible. It says, stand therefore. Again, we're to stand. We're to be stationary. We're to be, you know, we're to be in a place where we're, our faith doesn't waver. We're to be established in that truth and not allow things of this world to distract us. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with the truth. Stand in the truth. Don't ever depart the truth. Don't take on the philosophies of men. Look at the truth of God and stand in that truth. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the blessed breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. The shield of faith. Stand fast in the faith, our text said, did it not? That is your seal, shield against the fiery darts of Satan. Stand fast in the faith. The faith once delivered unto the saints and never waver from that faith. Hold fast your profession of faith, not wavering because he that promised is faithful, the Lord Jesus Christ. As we come to a close, we think about the words in 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, chapter 2 and verse 1. <coughs> it says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The grace of God is our strength. The Lord is our strength. Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Romans chapter 4 and verse 20. We get a lesson of someone that I believe had a blessed life. He was spoken of in the Old Testament, New Testament like Abraham. Verse 20 says, He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. Have any of us ever staggered at the promise of God through unbelief? We either believe that God wouldn't stoop down to help some lowly mortal like we are. We didn't have the kind of importance that Abraham or David or any of these patriarchs had, but they were men just like us, called out of life's journey. They wasn't any more important than anyone else. Abraham, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in the faith, giving glory to God. That right there is what God calls upon us to do every day of our life, to be strong in the faith and give the glory to God, not to the world, not to ourselves, but into the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that as the young people are here in this church, and there's not many of them, and in our sister churches and wherever they might be, that they would watch. I don't think it's, it's so easy when you're young to let the gospel of Jesus Christ and the teachings of God's word just go over your head. You, you, you're in a place of life, if you would like me, where it doesn't seem important to you. 
But then we look down and see our children. Maybe our children are not where we wanted them to be. Maybe your children won't be where you wanted them to be. And maybe that's because we didn't take heed unto God's word. You know, his way is perfect. My way is certainly not perfect. May we stand fast in his faith. And we be, maybe we, we be strong in the Lord every day of our life. Because Satan, our adversary, he's not giving up. He'll be there as long as we live until we go home to be with the Lord. May the Lord bless you as my prayer this morning. I thank you for your attention. Uh,